Hello, everyone. Welcome to episode two of the Scrivenery. I am Ed Hi, Sink from Rare Game Games. And I'm Trevor Stamper from Blind Visionary Publications. And so we're here to talk to you again about uh, how to do third party publishing uh, for Goodman Games related materials. As with before, I'm going to pop our email addresses into the chat so that if you have questions later on, you can get in touch with us that way. And so without further ado, <clears throat> uh, I'll, I'll give a real quick, we'll give a real quick uh, review, uh, just kind of touching back where we had been the, the first episode. If, if you haven't seen that, you may want to go back and look at that. Because in the first episode, which was during Empire Cyclops Con, we talked some about the, the preliminary steps. Uh, if you're thinking about putting forth a third party publication, what are the things that you, you want to weigh, that you want to consider, that you want to know about beforehand, uh, what the, that process looks like getting started, and uh, some ways that you can, some things, expenses that you'll have, and, and uh, some ways that you can, can have the money for that in terms of uh, funding and so forth. And then we also talked about uh, routes to, to sell your products. So today we're going to be focusing more on the creation of the product, how to go from uh, having your, your manuscript to something that can actually be published. So <clears throat> there's two essential formats, digital and physical print. And you may do one or the other, you may do both. And you, you really want to have some sense of, of this before you're heading too deep into the project because it will affect some of what you do as you go down the road in terms of how you're setting up your material. The, of course, the, the making the digital project product rather is, is certainly far more straightforward than, than dealing with print because uh, you have a number of different options and basically you're just you're just producing a, 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 a digital document, whether that's, uh, and, and so your, um, your creation can be maybe just in, maybe you're just uh, particularly in the initial stage, maybe you're just using a word processor. That's absolutely right. And there's a lot of different word processors you could use, right? I mean, we're all familiar with uh, products like Microsoft Word or on the Mac side, uh, you have Pages, Open Office. For, uh, for Windows, uh, um, but there are other ones as well. Uh, you could use Microsoft Publisher or Google Docs. Also, um, there are a couple that I'd like to highlight. Uh, Nesis Writer Pro for the Mac people out there um, is a great, uh, very, uh, very cheap, but very, very well-organized uh, um, uh, word processor. And finally, you could uh, get rid of your word processors altogether and work in something like uh, Adobe Acrobat Pro although that has its downsides as well. Um, so all of these can do two things. They can process words and they can ultimately output something into a PDF format. Um, some of them have more capabilities and layout than others, but it just depends on the product. And you might wanna play around with those to see what you can get <clears throat> before you move forward. Yeah, and in, in, in terms of the, the format that you're gonna be putting out, you, as far as it seems to us, you're generally going to be wanting to do this as a PDF. There, it, it's just it's simply the most portable uh, type of document across whatever kind of platform platform that you're looking at, and and so that, um, if nothing else, makes it uh, certainly the, the the best candidate for for how you want your document, your final document, to be set up. Um, it also gives you the opportunity to to embed your fonts into the document. And uh, we'll, we'll talk uh, uh, some more about what that can get you, but um, that, that really helps with some of the, the uh, advantages that you get from the digital format in general. That's right. And there are some definite advantages for digital formats, Ed. I mean, um, you can create documents that are um, searchable, right? So if you've got a 400 page document, and you're looking for a certain patron and you don't know what page they're normally on, you can just search for them. 
um, they're incredibly portable, right? So you can put them on your phone or you can put them on an iPad or a tablet of some sort. And, um, you know, they don't take up any physical space. So you could have thousands of them on there. As a matter of fact, I use my iPad all the time at conventions simply because I can put, uh, or I have PDFs of almost every Goodman product and, and all of my third-party products that, that give out PDFs and I can search through them and get to them very easily without having to carry a lot of weight with me. Um, they're also shareable. By that, mean, uh, we don't mean that you should be sharing copies illegally. We mean that you can copy and paste text out of them into things like chat brow, uh, windows and everything. So if you need to share a specific observation with a player, you can simply copy the text and paste it right in. Or you can um, you know, take a screenshot or something of a piece of artwork and show that to the group. Um, readily without having to have a physical document for yourself. Um, there's a lot of other things you can do. As a matter of fact, you could hot link them, right? So you can create hot links within the documents so you can move uh, around them much more quickly and easily. They're very easy to update and I'm sure Ed can give us some details on that. Um, and they have some other sensory inputs that I haven't seen people use in the gaming area, but I've definitely seen in other areas. So you can create visual layers, which is good for maps that you can turn on and turn off. So the game master or the judge can see certain layers that the players can't. Um, you can embed sounds into them and also movies. Um, you can create you know, pinch and zoom points where you need to go in and get details uh, rather easily. And if you're really, really creative and ambitious, you can put in actual 3D rotatable objects. So if you have a 3D image of your, of your village or something, you can actually put that in and people can move through it and do fly throughs and everything. So there's a ton of stuff you can do here. What are some of the things that you think of, Ed, when you think of you know, building your digital files? Well, so you, since you'd mentioned uh, uh, updating, to me, that's a pretty big deal because it's, it's very easy to, to update your, your digital format and so this lets this lowers the threshold of when you might put out a, a new version, a new iteration rather. And maybe that's just simply for, oh, I found on this particular page, I had a typo that uh, I had the wrong patron's name, for example, or, or the wrong spell name or whatever it might be. And personally, uh, I have a spreadsheet that I keep where I track every change that I make from after the point that it has been uh, issued out the point that I've released it for the first point for sale. I call that version one and just kind of like software, I just track what are all the different changes that I've made. And uh, in the document, then I'll on usually my second page, I'll, I'll say this is edition 1.2 or whatever. And so uh, when I make those little changes, it's very easy to get those pushed back out and, and for, through certain depending on what your your distribution mechanism is if it's a a publishing site such as drive through for example you put up a new version they will automatically send it to the people who who've already bought it and i suspect that most people who are looking at publishing are probably already thinking in terms of at the very least they would they would do digital but if you're not if you're only thinking of well i just want to do print let me encourage you to to have a digital version as well because i think that really uh, that's a nice selling point. There are a lot of sites, for example, where you you want to buy uh, you, the print copy and they will generally arrange, oh, you can get the, if you buy the print, you can get the digital at this discounted rate or free. And to me, that's a strong selling point. I know when I go looking for one, that's certainly something that appeals to me. And there are people in, in parts of the world that maybe shipping is going to take a long time for your product to get there. And so if they can get a digital copy of it and maybe that's all they want to order, you know, don't, don't miss out on those sales. Absolutely. I mean, there are some wonderful benefits to, to digital files uh, and, you know, from their portability to their updatability to their shareability and things like that. But there's also the other side of this process, right? There is the print product creation. And so you can actually create a physical product. Um, something that you can hold, something that you can you know, send to people and they can hold and work with for years. And we're all familiar with these, right? We all have copies of our original monster manuals laying around and stuff that you know are still going along really well after 30 to 40, 50 years of use. Um, and so the print media 
is definitely a tried and true methodology that's been around obviously since the very beginning of gaming uh, and long before. And, uh, and there's a lot of different formats and things you can do with this. Um, most of us are familiar with that kind of standard sized eight and a half by 11 type book or a six by nine or a seven by 10. These are common formats for books, um, you know, novels and things like that. But there's a whole bunch of other stuff you can do. One of the things we see really commonly with zines is a staddle stitch format, right? And so these are just folded over pieces of paper. They're connected with a, with a, with a, um, with a staple. So this is actually staple saddle stitch, but you can also um, actually sew through down this spine and that's actual saddle stitched. Um, and, and, and you can actually have them you know, threaded together. Um, there's also square bound. And, um, and so you can get you know, examples of, of square bound books everywhere. Here's a good example of a square bound book. These are individual leaves. They're not, bound, they're not folded over. They're just collated together, glued on the end. And then they fold this piece of paper, the cover stock over it. That's a square bound, right? Um, there are other things you can do as well. Um, spiral bound is pretty rare in the gaming industry, but can be very useful uh, because it allows your pages to lay flat and it allows you to move between them pretty easily. Um, and it's often a cheaper option than something like a Smithsone binding, which is a really high premium hardcover binding that also allows you to lay your textbooks or your books flat. You also have three ring binders. They're pretty rare. I mean, I can only think of two products off the top of my head that really use 3D, uh, three ring binders. That would be the second edition Monstrous, uh, Monster Manuals, right? The Monstrous Compendiums. Um, one of my favorite products actually that came out of second edition, except, um, you know, which was nice. You could pull out individual monsters and, and right. carry them around. Um, and then also uh, Epsilon City by Goodman Games, which is a Metamorphosis Alpha product which is also in a, in a three ring binder type format. <clears throat> so there's just a host of things you can do. There are other binding formats that are non-traditional or traditional to other cultures that you could also bring in. Um, but those are the primary ones we're gonna, we're gonna talk about. Um, product size is really, can be almost anything you can imagine from a little two inch by three inch book all the way up to think of the oversized Judges Guild uh, books by uh, Goodman Games which if I remember correctly are 18 inches by like 15 inches or, or 13 inches. They're an odd size and they're really hard to get a cover co uh, for so you can keep them in really good shape. Um, six by nine is very standard. Uh, that's the standard kind of zine size in the United States. It's very similar to A5, which is within a quarter or three eighths of an inch of six by nine in either, either dimension. Five by eight, which is the uh, size that we use for Tales from the Smoking Worm. Eight and a half by 11, which I think, Ed, you actually use eight and a half by 11 quite a bit, right? Yeah, that's solely what I've used. Yeah, and, and, and that also is a good size. It fits in a, a backpack fine. It is a, the size that most of your rule books are going to be. There are other odd sizes that you can go with. Seven by 10. I recently picked up a Morkborg product that was 10 inches by 10 inches. It was really neat, actually. It was a square bound product, 10 inches by 10 inches, hardback. And uh, it had tarot cards you could lay down so you could randomize monsters on the page. Um, and so that was a card book combination. What you should be hearing here is there is a myriad of choices that you can make in a physical product that you don't have to make or you can't make in a, in a PDF or a, or a digital product, right? That physical product made either by hand or in low print runs uh, with, with kind of custom or bespoke printers can be anything you can imagine, right? It can have gold foil stamping on it. It can have incredibly high-end paper. It can be archival quality. It could be cotton rag paper instead of wood pulp paper. Um, there's, when you get into the paper, uh, looking at paper, there are hundreds of paper companies and they all have very different types of, uh, of modifying paper, ways to modifying paper. So it looks felted or it's ribbed or it's patterned. The colors come in a wide dizzying array of colors from speckled to every color you can imagine. All of these things can be put together in different combinations to create the exact product you wanna create. Um, there really is, I mean, the sky is the limit here. <clears throat> now with all of that customization comes complexity and cost. Um, and so, you know, that's the kind of the bespoke market. 
I Young think that's man. where we want to, to draw the distinction. We, there's two basic categories in terms of printing, broadly speaking. Uh, you've got um, uh, you've got your bulk slash custom print process versus your print on demand. Absolutely right, and so and I would take that 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 bulk custom and 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 it's kind of think of it this way: custom is the mo the most number of options you can get. Anything you can you can comprehend or think about that could be your custom. Then you have this kind of bulk um, non print on demand type copies, you're going to have some choices, they're going to be pretty broad, but they're going to be less than what you can get from the truly custom. And then you have print on demand, where you're going to have very few choices, um, one or two paper types, uh, one type of hard binding, one type of uh, soft binding, for instance, drive through used to do saddle stitch, now they've gone only to square bound and hardback. Um, and so, so you have this range of choices. With those range reduction in range of choices, obviously comes a simplification of costs, a simplification of your project. It's easier to get off the ground and, and move forward. And so start small and build, right? Um, there's a lot you can do um, and, and everything. And there's a wide range of providers. To get you started with providers, I would recommend that you go to uh, drive through RPG and create a publisher um, account and then go look at their options. And I think we've got some links later on some of the options on, on different out, layout outputs and how that interacts with the printing process um, for drive through. And then I would also look at the company called Mixam. It's M I X A M. We'll have a link for you. Uh, it's mixam.com. The wonderful thing about drive through and Mixam is this you can literally look at their cost and benefit analysis. You can say, I want to do an eight and a half by 11 book on drive through and I want it to be hardback and I want it to be on premium paper. And they'll tell you the base cost is this and it's this much extra per page, right? And so you can work out the cost of your product and then be able to do a cost benefit analysis uh, and, and work out how much you have to price that out. And that's a whole other show, um, but that is there. On Mixam, it's even easier you literally have a web browser interface and you say, I want to print X number of copies in this size with this paper in color or black and white um, with this type of cover and so on and so forth. And it's got drop down menus and you quickly interact with it. And, uh, and it will actually in real time give you a price quote. And, and that's really powerful because it allows you while you're thinking about your format to say, gosh, what is, what is actually possible with what I can do? And the type of money I've got, and that'll help you understand that 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 print, uh, you know, quality and, and print output again that that cost benefit analysis. Um, so, or you, you tell can us go a little. I'm oh, sorry. Even further custom. And, oh no, you can go further custom. I use Rosa Graphic Printing for the uh, for the limited editions of the Smoking Worm, and uh, and these are are literally hand assembled. So tell us what the yeah. process is like for uh, when you're dealing with a, a bulk print printer, how that, what the, what the steps are uh, and, and what that process is like in, to, to getting that, um, to getting that physical product to you. Sure. Yeah. Um, hold on just a second. I'm having an internet connection problem. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes. Good. Um, I'm sorry, what was your question again? So uh, <clears throat> the process dealing with a, a, a bulk print run, how does that, uh, how does that would you, step by yeah. step go? Would you, what do you do? And, and what are the, um, uh, you know, what, what kind of costs are you looking at? Uh, so, and because certainly one of the, one of the implications that you have to keep, keep in mind for a bulk print is the cost impact. That's right. And so you need to understand that when you are printing and you're going to print in bulk, you're going to print a hundred copies or 500 copies or a thousand copies of something, right? When you're going to print in those kinds of quantities, um, you need to understand that the first copy that you make is like 90% of your cost, right? All of the setup fees and everything are attached to it. 
and then the price goes down very exponentially um, as you move out in quantity. Now it never gets to the point where it's cheaper to print like five times is what you, you know five times what you had at a low end. So five of them is just the same cost as twenty five of them or twenty five hundred of them or something like that. But it's it's always a little more expensive. But you can get your cost per book down, um, ex, you know, exceptionally low actually compared to a very low print run. What does this mean for you? Well, it means it's cheaper to print more books on a cost per book than it is to print fewer books, obviously. But but there's kind of a catch twenty two here. Um, you don't you you need to really understand your audience and how many copies you're going to sell. Um, you don't want to print pallets and pallets and pallets of book, th books, thousands and thousands of them, and only sell 100, and then have all that stock sitting around that you've invested money in, but you can no longer sell. So you need to understand your audience size. Um, and then at the same time, you know, you need to look at it and say, how you know, 90% or the vast majority of your sales are going to occur, in my experience, in the first two to three months of publishing. Right, and I completely agree with that. Yeah, that first. There may be month. there may be certain things that happen, like a convention or something like that, that will help give you a little bit of splash, a little bit of bump. But most of your sales are going to come from uh, at, at that beginning stage. Yeah, so you're going to have a flush of sales. That's going to be really exciting, and you're going to say, "Gosh, if I could sustain this, this would be awesome." And then you're going to discover that that's not how that works, <laughs> and um, and 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 that that you'll get kind of a, a residual sale rate after that point. Um, this is actually something that gets talked about quite a bit in the uh, RPG zine group. Um, um, they haven't talked about it recently, but there's often long conversations about looking at, looking at sale curves and everything. And, you know, how can I try and boost sales? And when I have a boost in sales, was that a random event or was it, did it time with something? And uh, you find that if the more products you put out, the more your residual sales will climb. And things like that. There's a relationship between the number of things that you actually produce. But in general, let's come back to the beginning and focus. You're going to you sell most of your product right away. Okay. So you don't know how well your product's going to do necessarily. So you're kind of hedging your bets, right? You want to print enough that you've got some um, that you can make enough money to then do a subsequent print run if there's a demand to do that. And you know, pay off all of your expenses and everything. So those are the types of cost benefit analysis that I'm talking about. Um, in general, what I look at is, um, uh, you know, we try and that's why we run Kickstarters as a matter of fact, because we can build those cost analysis into it. We can say, if we print 300 of this and I sell 200 immediately, everything's paid for and I'll sell the other hundred over a couple of months. Um, and then if I need to reprint, I will. Mm -hmm. right? So uh, does that make sense? Or uh, do you have any questions about that, Ed? No, I think that's a good uh, highlighting of the things that you need to, to be aware of. And with, with that in mind, I, I think that it's not such a bad idea if when you're just getting into this process and into the market to start off with print on demand um, it, because that helps you get your get some exposure out there without a big investment of cost, very little investment in cost, and starting to get a sense of what your market size will be. Because a lot of times people, uh, you know, find it hard to estimate, well, how, how many copies am I realistically going to sell? And so uh, the print-on-demand approach is really nice from the standpoint that uh, it, it, it has a, a very low investment to get you going. Now, there are some downsides. Uh, as, as Trevor mentioned, you're generally going to have fewer options in terms of your formatting. The, uh, and now I'm speaking just from the standpoint of the, my experience has, has all been through drive-through RPG, uh, but I think it's, it's fairly typical. You know, you'll, you'll pick, okay, I'm, I'm going to have, um, this is going to be the size of my product. It's going to be eight and a half by 11. I want it to be soft cover or hard cover. Um, and here's how many pages it will be so forth. And then here's the type of paper I'm going to use. And you've got three choices of paper. Uh, and it's, and there's not a great deal of difference between them. So uh, that's the downside. Um, the, the up, the main upside really is 
the um, the cost. So when I put up a new product, it's going to ask, it's going to tell me I need to have, order a proof copy. And this proof copy is going to come to me uh, as a chance to verify that that what I've put together is exactly correct before it's going to go live. And they require you to have that proof copy before you before you can make the product available for sale. That proof copy, in some cases, is your only expense. Now, there's other things that we'll talk about later in terms of software to get you going, but I mean, per project. And so that can be, you're just ordering a copy of your own product at a wholesale price, so at cost. So it's not a, a lot of investment of, of, of expense. So instead of saying, oh, I'm going to print a thousand copies of it, it's it's you're paying for one copy up front and you know on the downside when uh you or someone else wants to do an order that that's not something that's in stock you put in the order and it gets printed okay well there's a little bit of a lag time there a little bit of a delay so it takes a little bit longer a few days maybe for the product to get shipped out but for getting started it's it's really a, a good option uh, to to get you going inexpensively and so as to, to, to be in a situation where you can start to assess how many how many customers am I likely to have and it, 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 it once you get that first product out there you know some of those same people may be the ones who will buy your other products and so that can give you a probably a, a fairly accurate estimate of uh, the scope the market scope for your particular product Absolutely. And this idea of, um, of, you know, proof copies is not unique to something like drive through. Um, we do digital proof copies when we work with Mixam. Um, and then I order print copies as well. Um, I usually order five, just because I want to see if there's any if there's any slippage in between print runs, right. So those are all printed at the same time. But within that print run, are the pages looking are they lining up nicely? Is it all looking uniform and everything? Um, and there's not that much of a difference in cost between one and five. So you can definitely do that one or five or three. We've done that sometimes too. Um, now, this idea of proof copies is something that's completely foreign to somebody who only prints digitally, right? Because they don't have to do that. The digital product is the product. It's never going to change. It's built that way. Um, but you also see proof copies come through on even the high-end customization, you know, bespoke type book bindings as well. And so uh, as a matter of fact, that can be even more complicated because they're going to give you step-by-step -step proof copies of everything along the way. Um, and so you're going to see, let's say you do hot foil stamping, you're going to see an example of the hot foil stamp. You're going to see a layout of the page, uh, uh, you know, of your cover and everything with all the cut marks and everything with your printing on it and your hot foil stamping on it. You're going to see um, the thickness of your book, if you're doing a hardback book or something that requires a spine, right? And you're going to get to look at those and compare them and stuff. You're going to see the paperweight. Um, then they're going to give you, send you signatures and signatures for correction, because you can go in and make individual changes sometimes on these really high-end runs. Um, you know, this is, this is something you should just get used to, because a proof copy is an invaluable, um, basically, it's an invaluable resource, right? It allows you to firmly make sure that everything's going to go the way you want it to before you hit the button and print all your copies, because that's a huge investment in money. And so this little investment of money, this is, is great insurance against that risk. Um, yeah. As much as you may be chomping at the bit, you, you finally get that, because trust me, I know I've been there. You get that proof copy in the mail. You're all excited, especially if this was your first one, your first, your first publication, you want to go live, you want to get that out there pour over that trust me i know you've proofread the the manuscript multiple times i know you've looked at the cover multiple times but trust me go over the proof copy one of the things that trevor mentioned that is not insignificant he's talked about the issue of slippage uh, uh repeatability from one print copy to the next um and so look for uh how close are my my various text and graphics and everything to the edge both my on my pages as well as the cover um look over my look over your cover was there anything uh out of place typos etc um 
because what you don't want to do is take this you get this proof copy and you say okay great yes it's a physical book that means i'm ready to go and you hit go live and then a couple weeks later you realize oh i made this error of some kind and then you've got to take it back down from being publicly available while you send new information get a new proof copy etc you don't want to be there so uh, use the proof copy for what it's for. Look it over, use it as a, a proofing process. <clears throat> and if you're getting multiple copies, look at them, compare them, make sure that there's, uh, that there's the, that the amount of difference that you may get in terms of exact location is within your tolerances. Yeah, and, and in addition to that, don't be the only person who looks at your proof copy. Hand them to your friends, hand them to your team, right? Um, if you really need to, send them to an artist who work, you're working with if they're particular about how their art is printed. I actually had an artist come back on one, of my, on one of my print runs and say, you know, that picture, that image didn't look really sharp. I was kind of disappointed in that. And, um, and we went back to the digital file that that person had sent and discovered they had sent an inferior scan that we hadn't caught, right? These things happen. Um, and so the proof copy is a wonderful time to make sure that your product is as cool and awesome as you really want it to be. So don't overlook it. It's a wonderful tool. Um, and it exists, like I said, in all the formats. So when, when you get to physical copies, you're going to see these things and they're going to, they're going to be kind of neat. And um, you know, it's, it's a piece of ephemera, right? This is, this is something that is a tool, but you know, only a couple of them exist. Um, I keep them and I actually give them to friends and stuff um, because ultimately, you know, that's all they are. Uh, but, you know, most of, they're just kind of a cool factor to them. Uh, they're like artist prints, like AP prints, you know, so when the artist has touched it and hit AP on it, you know, written AP on it, that means that they've approved of it. That's the kind of cool stuff that you're thinking about here. Well, and when your product um, becomes famous, then that could be a collector's item. That, that uh, becomes could, a collector's item, right? You could have um, a, at a, at an, a, a charity auction. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, you know, we've, we've now talked about the range of physical products, right? We've talked about the range of digital products. We've talked about the complexities that, 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 that digital products have kind of lower complexity. Um, a physical copy, uh, you know, products have a range of complexity from low end complexity because you have limited choices to literally any choice you can think of. Um, and it can get really complicated. This is it. And it's kind of fun to do that stuff. I mean, don't, don't get me wrong, mm -hmm. but behind all of this um, today, the vast majority of people are working in some kind of digital format, even like Goodman games, you're working with analog art, uh, which is what we do here at the smoking worm as well. We're digitizing that and we're working with it. Right. And so you, you started with a manuscript or, or, um, you know, basically a word processor. And once you're done with the text, you're going to move over to typesetting and, and layout software. So, Ed, what kinds of layout software do we have? What, what, what could people use? Yeah, so this was something that when I first started going into the, the publishing process, totally was not on my radar. I was expecting, you know, I saw that, um, uh, that my printer drive through, in my case, well, you've got to send them a, a PDF of your of your uh interior contents even for the print product and interior contents uh, uh of your book i thought okay i've got you know i can i can output pdfs from word or whatever else i want to use mm -mm. no 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 it's a very different thing um you're not going to just take your typical word processor and through whatever mechanism output it as a pdf so typesetting or layout software um is this is a uh, software that is designed to it is designed around more around the the print format for example um the one that i use is called scribus which is uh, a uh, windows application that is available free of charge uh it's got a little bit of a, of a learning curve to it but um once you once you start to use it uh, i feel like it, it it's not too terribly complicated and so this works in a format to where you, you put a block, an object on each page uh, that is a block where the text is going to go into or a, a, another object, which is where a graphic is going to be. 
And uh, if and this doesn't this isn't free flowing text that as you paste in another paragraph, it's going to spill onto the next page. No, this is contained within this block that's on this page, and it's treated as an object on that page where you which you control the location of very tightly. Um, but also uh, the software, because it's oriented around book printing, it includes things like bleed lines and to, in addition to margins and, and gutter lines and things that are going to be taken into account with a, uh, with a print format that is not really relevant for digital. Uh, so uh, Trevor, as I understand, you use a, a different software for, for doing this process? Yeah, I, I use, um, we use InDesign. Uh, we use the entire Adobe suite and you know the the upside of InDesign is it's an industry standard, right? It's used worldwide in the publishing industry. I've used InDesign since it, before it was InDesign back in the in the in the early '90s. It was Aldous PageMaker. I used that in high school because I actually had a graphic design class in high school. And then um, it eventually was purchased by uh, by Adobe, and it was integrated in with Illustrator and everything as a suite with Photoshop and stuff. And um, and so. Nowadays, you can get InDesign by itself, which you're usually getting it as a suite of products, which include Acrobat Pro, include InDesign, Illustrator, and Photoshop. Um, that's kind of their, their publishing suite. And so um, this has a lot of advantages. Um, it allows you to move between illustration and, and, and layout uh, really well. They're, they're, they're tightly integrated. And there's a lot of things you can do and they can be deeply linked and embedded. So you can change one thing in Photoshop and have it change throughout your product and stuff. Um, in general though, most layout programs are, they've, they've got a little bit of a steep learning curve, but there's a lot of ways you can learn to use them, especially when you're looking at the, uh, the Adobe suite. Um, I actually recently, cause I'm always trying to brush up on new ways to do things. Obviously uh, everybody probably is pretty aware of YouTube and stuff. But there is a new platform called uh, uh, Domestica, and they have targeted, you know, three and four hour courses on how to use Adobe InDesign from scratch. You literally, you've never opened the program before, and they're going to take you through every window and every option so you understand how to use it. So don't be afraid of this software. It's actually pretty easy to get hold of. The downside of it is, is it's expensive, right? Uh, for me, uh, license is about $600 a year. And so, uh, you know, that needs to be worth my time and effort uh, in order to pay for that. Um, I'm betting that Scribus is probably cheaper. Scribus is free, actually. Scribus is free, right? Yeah. So that's a great reason to want it right there. And if I wasn't working, you know, the, the wonderful thing about InDesign is when I have a problem, um, I can go to a lot of others. The, the pool of help is bigger. But if I need to, I can literally send those InDesign files off to my printer or my publisher or whoever I'm working with that we're having this disconnect and they can look at it and give me some feedback. Mm -hmm. um, you don't generally want to do that because, uh, you know, uh, a PDF format means that everything is built into that PDF and it, and it can be opened anywhere and viewed in the same way. InDesign is obviously pulling in links and linking to a whole bunch of external files. So if you don't send the whole package of files with it, it doesn't look at, at all like what you think it looks like on your end. For another viewer so it can be complicated mm -hmm. um but it's yeah it's a it's a pretty good layout software gives you a lot of customization it is pretty feature heavy so one of the things or a couple of things really that you, that you want to keep in mind with the process of using whatever layout software you're dealing with uh they will and one of the reasons why you're using this type of software instead of say a word processor is that, uh, and this is something I wasn't aware of going into this, there are multiple subformats to PDF. Uh, uh, and these subformats will be, a specific one or two subformats will be required by your printer. You, it's not just send it in PDF, it's send it in pre PDF uh, 1XA or 3 or whatever the subversion is. And so the these software projects will have the ability to designate that particular setting as well as um, uh, graphics and or colored text really, I guess if it comes down to it, um, there are different um, color spaces. Uh, you've got uh, the, the uh, CMYK, for example, and, and the, so the software 
you can designate, this is how I want my color spacing encoded. Uh, there's also the ability to embed fonts into a PDF that you generate, because otherwise, if you, uh, if you, because I use the, the, I make one document in, in Scribus, which I output uh, my, my content, which is going to go towards the, the printer. And then I take, I, I output from the same thing that's going to be my digital copy. So that I'm, I'm not having to deal with two different versions. And when I make that digital version, if I haven't embedded fonts into it, um, it will not, some those, those things that are uh, the cool features of, of, of the PDF, you know, the searchability, the uh, copy and, and so forth, though you're not gonna have those. You, you can't select text if, if, if the fonts haven't been embedded into it. So uh, look into these, these nuts and bolts of using these software, look into the settings and but it'll uh, because they're designed for uh, being able to handle print products, you can set things like uh, the 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 um, bleed margin, which is how much space you have to provide for for things that can go beyond the um, the, the the page size, uh, the um, as well as uh, you can have. Um, page templates, you know, at, at the bottom of every page, I want you to automatically put this page number mechanism in with a graphic and everything. So uh, these are things that you want to keep in mind uh, and look for in terms of features. And uh, like uh, Trevor was saying, there are certainly uh, tools out there and, and references, uh, groups and so forth in terms of, and, and the links that I posted in the, um, uh, in the chat will provide also some some references that you can look at in terms of getting more, more information on using the software. Steep learning curve, but it's uh, they're part, very powerful and, and useful pieces of software. Absolutely, and and I think your point about color space is really uh, something that we could we could drill into pretty quickly here. Um, if you're looking at a digital file, it's using RGB, right? Red, green, blue, which is the the basically the pixels on your screen. And in order to generate any color that you need, if you're using a print copy, if you're actually going to offset press it or something, that's the CMYK space, right? So that's cyan, magenta, black, and yellow, right? And, and so you're actually mixing those colors to get different types of colors. Um, and then we also use, um, for instance, I use something called a risographic printing, and that uses a PMS system, right? And so that, that PMS system, uh, everything gets moved over to a different color space and everything. And you can alter these just with a click of a button um, in, your, you know, in, in your layout software. But sometimes you need to go through and actually designate any, every individual item you want to be a certain color, that space, right? And that's important. Um, and so I actually output, or, or my team uh, and my designer, Caitlin, uh, outputs multiple formats. Um, so we actually do a, a digital PDF that's gonna go on drive-through. It's gonna be a mirror of our um, of our risographic limited edition right uh, uh, a copy that we do and so it's going to have the same layout space and everything it, it'll be slightly tweaked because uh, one of the things we do in the limited editions that we can't do anywhere else is we have these cool um, fold out pages and so you can actually fold out a page so this requires this is that bespoke end uh, of the line and so that'll get reformatted those couple of pages but the colors will profiles will match almost exactly, even though it's RGB versus the PMS colors. Um, and then from there, once we're happy with those and we've sent that off to the printer and we've got it back and everything, then we actually start looking at what we call our standard edition, which is something we print off of a Mixam, and this is CMYK. Um, and so, um, so this is actually the proof copy for issue one. And, um, and it uses an entirely different color space. So each one of those formats gets saved separately. And this is where um, project management becomes really important in my mind. If you don't have a good handle on what you're doing and where you're keeping all of your formats and all your different versions of things, um, just like with a manuscript, you're gonna get lost very quickly and you're gonna lose information. And so, um, so we've developed one very specific way of doing things that we, uh, we kind of intuitively felt out through the first two issues of Tales from the Smoking Worm. And by issue three, it was pretty firmly embedded. 
going forward, it's even more grounded. And as your team gets more used to doing this type of stuff, this will become second nature to you. Um, it's a lot like Ed's, um, you know, revision formatting notes, right, for his documents and stuff. Um, that's important too, to, to work off of it. Both of us have a different way of denoting that, but we're still denoting it somehow. Yeah, so um, the final piece that we want to talk about in terms of what you need to do to produce the print copy is the cover. And uh, again, in my case, this, uh, this was kind of an eye-opening experience. This is a little bit more complicated than I was expecting. Because uh, I was thinking in terms of, I've got my graphic of what I want my front cover to be. I've got my graphic of what I want my back cover to be. And I thought, well, I just tack those on to the beginning and end of my, my manuscript uh, PDF. And, uh, and there I've got it. And, and then I find out, no, at least for my particular printer, you've got, I've, you've got one file that is your contents, a PDF that is your contents that I've output from my, from my layout software. And then another file that is just the cover, and it's formatted in a in a broad in a broad landscape uh, format. So, like you took the book and you um, uh, flattened it out, and uh, so that it's, it's got both the front and back cover uh, on one. And the way that uh, at least the, the my printer operates is, and I just put up a, a link for this you have to get a cover template file. This is absolutely required. And this, you, when, you, when this template is generated, you put in uh, the parameters, like it's gonna be hardback, it's gonna be 180 pages, it's gonna be this kind of paper, so it can size everything. And then it's got, it creates this template that's got this box on it. And I'm gonna put my graphic on there that is my, my background for my cover. And then I'm gonna put all my text on there and so forth. And then, and I'm doing all this in my layout software again. And then I generate a new PDF that is just that template with my stuff on it that is the graphical representation of my cover. So, um, so your your printer is drive through RPG, right? That's yes. A, a Lightning Source is the actual printer. Correct. Um, that that drives that system. Um, you know, my, my printer is a little different. So when I work at, with, with Rizzo, everything is one file. Now that doesn't mean that we don't follow templates and stuff, but everything is embedded in one file. And when I've worked with Mixam, everything is one file too. So this is an important thing to think about is uh, you need to communicate with your, uh, your, your printer of choice on these physical products, whether they're print on demand or bespoke. And you need to have a good constant conversation to make sure you get the best possible product you can um, because if you don't they'll still print what you send them but it won't look as great as it could and uh, and so you just need to know how that process goes um, certainly if they send you a template you should probably put that on a layer in your into you know your layout program and and follow it pretty slavishly because that is their shorthand way of telling you this is the best path to success yeah, and in fact, at least with my printer, it's an absolute requirement. If you don't use the template, they're just not going to take it. Yeah. And so going through this process, um, pay a lot of attention to that to that cover that you've generated. Um, you know, a cover doesn't necessarily sell a book, but is it's that first thing that grabs interest. And um, and so don't don't. Sh uh, don't shortchange that process in terms of time of how uh, how much attention to detail you're putting into the type of text that you're using. How well does the text stand out from the background? You know, for example, um, I like to go with a text color that that is very different from from the background, um, is very clear, so that it, it's eye catching. And uh, things in and certainly for Goodman Games, this is where you're also going to need to be concerned about. Uh, the the compatibility logo that they've sent you, where that's located, how big it is, uh, make sure that's clear. Um, and uh, any other piece of information that you've got on there, go over it and proofread it just like you would your manuscript. Have After you've looked at it, have your, your other people look at it and make sure that that's set to go before you send that off. Uh, because as we talked about that proofing process, you really got to 
keep in mind, that's going to take some time, you know, and, and frankly, at the very minimum, two weeks to, to send your, your format files to the, to your publishing house and have them send you a proof copy and you go live. Frankly, I'd bank more on a month to, uh, for that process. Uh, prepare yourself for that because if you get too anxious about it and think, oh, oh, I'm set to go, I can go live now. Understand that there's going to be that time that it takes for the, for the proof copy and a lot of times that first proof is not going to be right where you want it and you need to make adjustments and get a new proof. Absolutely. Right. And so, so that means that you're going to double the time that you just took to get to your first proof to get to your second proof. Now you may be able to turn it around quickly, um, but allow yourself that time to take a breath and let everybody look at it and then think about it and make a measured decision on how you want to change it. Um, you know, this is all part of the process. And, and so as you lay out your timetable and your timeline for how you're working, um, once you get to these things at the very end, um, you have a tendency to want to push, 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 push through and get done as fast as possible. Because mm -hmm. frankly, you've probably looked at your file 900 million times and, um, and you're kind of tired of seeing it sometimes, right? And you want, it, you want, it, you want that, that physical payoff. You want that product in your hand. Um, but you won't be happy with that product if you don't take the time. So we've covered a lot in our first two episodes, Ed. I mean, we've covered the entire print, printing process from initial concept to final product. And, and that's all pretty dense, right? What else are we going to do? Are we going to come back for a third episode? Um, what are your thoughts? So yeah, we've, uh, we've got at least uh, one more episode that is uh, scheduled. That's going to be two weeks from today. And what we want to do there is take a deep dive into artwork. And so at that point, we're going to talk uh, about how you find artwork that you want to use, uh, the various places, the various routes that you can, that you can get artwork um, from uh, graphics that are free all the way up to graphics that you have commissioned and what those processes look like, uh, both in terms of the technical process as well as the implication it has for your publishing uh, and we're also going to have a special guest for that episode we're going to bring in bradley mcdevitt who is an artist who does a lot of work with goodman games and he's going to talk to us about uh, what the artist side of that process looks like uh, because we we feel like uh, it would help be helpful to people to know when i'm communicating with an artist you know what's an effective way to do that so that i can get some get the product that I'm most pleased with what does the artist want to hear from me what do they need to know about uh, what we're working on etc absolutely yeah uh, have you ever worked with Brad Ed uh, I've not had the pleasure so I've worked with Brad he's a great person to work with um, he was actually one of the first professional artists that I ever approached to work on Tales from the Smoking Worm and uh, and so I'm looking forward to sitting down and chatting with him it'll be really interesting I think to compare his perception of what that first conversation was between him and myself and what my perception of it was. And I guarantee you, they're probably very different. I was pretty nervous, um, not because Brad's a scary guy, but because I'd never had to approach an artist other than my buddies, right? And my friends and say, hey, uh, I got this idea. Could you, could you put it in ink for me, right? That's just not something I'd ever done before, really. And so um, those first steps were pretty tentative. Um, so yeah, I, I think I think just talking about artwork for an hour is uh, is a great way to go. There's a lot of different things you can do with artwork, and there's a lot of ways you can get artwork. Mm -hmm. And so um, so I could I could see it as a pretty exciting episode. I'm looking forward to it. All right, so that's what we've got for today. So we'll see you again, as I said, two weeks from today, same day, same time, and uh, we'll look forward to that episode. See you later, folks. All right, everybody, have a good afternoon. Mm -hmm.